Welcome to this session for Blackwell Global, are cryptocurrencies safe? Before we talk about the topic, let's have a look at the risk disclaimer. Risk warning, Forex and CFDs are leveraged products and they involve a high level of risk and can result in the loss of all your invested capital. Therefore, Forex and CFDs may not be suitable for all investors. You should not risk more than you are prepared to lose. Before deciding to trade, please ensure you understand the risks involved and take into account your level of experience. Seek independent advice if necessary. And the easiest way to get that is just get in touch with the competent people at Blackwell. Uh, they're available for you around the clock um, via chat or telephone line. So please don't hesitate to reach out to them if you have any questions. Now, with that um, important disclaimer out of the way, let's have a look at cybersecurity and have a look at, you know, I'm gonna how it all plays out with cryptocurrencies. So what everybody probably has heard or seen by now is Bitcoin. And Bitcoin is the first really well-known cryptocurrency born around 2008, so been around for almost 10 years, but only recently has really kind of seen uh, a lot of um, attention by investors, by the media, and seen its value go up radically in a way that you could think we are, you know, in a time where uh, maybe uh, to draw it from a comparison, was a time when tulip bulbs, you know, uh, where the, the flowers, in the Netherlands became so valuable that uh, kind of people would sell their houses just to get them. It was completely irrational just to do that for a flower. And uh, especially around November, December time frame of 2017, we have something seen something similar with cryptocurrencies as their value has really exploded quite a lot. And a lot of kind of millionaires have been made. And a lot of people have also in the same moment lost money. But what we've seen, we have seen unprecedented volatility in the markets. And look, as a day trader, that's really what we are seeking at the end of the day. That's what we need uh, to have a chance to become kind of highly profitable and successful in trading. We need a lot of movement. We need uh, a lot of volatility. And at, at the same time, when you see a movement like that, there's always a lot of um, concerns that come up around the security of uh, the cryptocurrency. And that's something that I want to discuss with you today, kind of also have a bit of a look at the kind of bad and the ugly news that we've seen in the past and um, then kind of filter through the noise and identify for you guys, you know, what is, um, uh, you know, what, what that really means from a, security point of view because i think one can thing can be said about cryptocurrencies in uh, general they are by far the safest currency out there and making a transaction through a blockchain is by far kind of the safest and most transparent way to do a transaction so let's have a, a look at that in more detail in this session so trust crypto so that uh, is a provocative statement that i picked for this slide, you may have seen, you know, what's in the picture beneath here before. And that is um, a, a screenshot, a screen grab of some ransomware that has been uh, uh, used in the past. So just to give you a context, um, somebody or a group of people who came up with a virus sent out um, uh, this ransomware and um, a virus. And they're specifically targeting vulnerable uh, technology systems. Um, a good example is here in the UK, the NHS. They still run largely kind of old computers with Windows XP systems, um, and these systems can be quite easily exploited by hackers. Why? Well, one reason is micro Microsoft has stopped uh, supporting Windows XP, and there are no more security patches and updates that are being issued kind of all new um, hacker viruses and threats, you know, to get through the system have a great chance of succeeding. And the NHS suffers from a very outdated computer system with completely outdated uh, uh, Windows applications. So that is number one. Secondly, you know, people who work in NHS, they're not computer geeks. 
we're doctors, we're nurses, you know, and we are being paid to do our work. Um, but we have to spend, naturally, we have to spend a lot of time in front of computers to do, you know, like a documentation and all that's required in modern medicine right now. So that combination is quite interesting for a hacker because on one hand side, it's quite easy then to attack a computer, which they've done, and they've done nothing else than uh, encrypting the data that sits on a computer. And think about the data of, I'm just making this up, hundreds of patients maybe, um, that is suddenly encrypted and not available anymore. That can result obviously in a big problem and that data cannot easily be recovered. And then on the other side, they use this ransomware and they send it out in emails, uh, you know, that look legitimate and people would click on a link and download the software. Uh, and the software would then create a, a, a screenshot um, like this or a, a, a screen like this and basically say, look, if you pay, and that's on the bottom right, if you pay 300 US dollars worth of Bitcoin, uh, to a certain address and when you see a very long combinations of letters and large and small um, caps letters and numbers that is the kind of the, 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 the key of a account number uh, that's probably when you look at it from a traditional banking perspective the account number where this money is getting transferred to and what the hackers really liked was the complete security and anonymity the cryptocurrency bitcoin would provide them with so nobody knows to this day really kind of sits behind this attack it was hugely successful a lot of people paid that ransomware and a lot of organization paid that ransomware because they kind of weighed the risks and the benefits and i said look um if we are losing all that uh data uh, maybe paying 300 um, US dollars worth of Bitcoin here and there is probably worth doing it versus going through the embarrassment of, uh, you know, being a victim to that, such a ransomware attack and and maybe admitting that there is a, is a bigger problem in, in the organization. And we've been actually quite clever in setting it up. When you look on the left hand side, uh, payment will be raised on, your file will be lost on. So we have a, a countdown in this case. Um, it's a uh, six days, uh, 23 hours, 57 minutes and 37 seconds. And uh, the closer we come to zero, kind of uh, the more people are probably being prompted to, to pay that money. And that led to a lot of um, bad press for Bitcoin, but um, there's kind of uh, no news uh, is worse than bad news. And uh, through the ransomware, Bitcoin obviously then really made it onto the radar of literally everybody because uh, kind of every news show uh, on the planet literally reported uh, this ransomware attack and uh, especially kind of in, in the western countries where this was done quite a lot um, so suddenly bitcoin was a thing and uh, we also did as you see in the previous um, slide i go back to that slide they also came up with a quite um, clever logo for bitcoin you look at that um, golden B, so and with the, the two kind of lines that go through um, vertically that you also know from currencies like the US dollar. So, so all that in our mind creates a sense of stability. You look at it, you see gold, uh, you look at it, you see the lines that create stability and you can immediately associate them with your understanding of an existing currency. So that was, that was quite cleverly done. That people almost think like this is a thing and Bitcoin is something you can actually put into your pocket in your wallet. But um, as I will show you in a moment, that wallet is not physical, but electronic. But all that together really, you know, helped to elevate uh, Bitcoin to, to a global stage and uh, made people and organizations aware of its existence and, and people looked into it. And... Uh, had to have it endorsed by <clears throat> highly sophisticated hackers um, obviously also was uh, something interesting and if, if they trust in that technology then well it's a question what else uh, uh, is a sensible application for for bitcoin and now we see even kind of banks start using bitcoin and black uh, blockchain transactions for first banks have now started using um, blockchains kind of in it's still in, in in its early stages but that has really uh, the power to revolutionize and transform the financial system as we know it and i have another session that will just 
co cover that topic so i encourage you also to have a look at uh have a look at that session so that is a starting point so crypto made it on everybody's radar can it be trusted well it's not the problem of crypto that the criminals um liked it so much actually i think it's more um a, a sign of its strength when it comes to security and anonymity in a transaction in the global financial markets that uh, these hackers um, have decided to use Bitcoin. So it, it shows two things. One is they trust that the transaction actually works. And secondly, they also trust that the value of Bitcoin will at least be stable. And they also speculate that the value will go up because you can imagine when they've done that, the value for um, a Bitcoin was much lower than compared to the 20,000 we've seen in Bitcoin at some at some point. So they have a, a positive effect also um, from a, a speculation perspective, because if they let their Bitcoins sit in the account and this money hasn't uh, at least fully, um, it has not been fully withdrawn. I think some of it has been withdrawn and they haven't identified the people behind that. But there is also a speculative element um, to it. So quite interesting um, development there. And suddenly crypto was kind of um, the, the flavor of a month and uh, Bitcoin and everybody was, was talking about it. But don't confuse it with uh, kind of Bitcoin itself being not secure. Um, that's actually quite the opposite is true. Let's go to the beginnings. And you may have seen the name Satoshi Nakamoto um, before. So who is Satoshi Nakamoto? The short answer is nobody really knows, but everybody knows. Why do I say that? Well, I have um, added you a screenshot of the paper that Satoshi has written uh, to this page. And you can see that, you know, he's talking about Bitcoin, a peer-to-peer -peer electronic cash system. If you want to get in touch with him, he even added his personal email address but i doubt that you get an answer in the past his emails i kind of have have been kind of emails that have been sent to his email account have been responded to but that has stopped quite quite a while ago and i'm pretty sure this email account by now is is full uh, feel free to try it there is a kind of a lot of legends and stories that have kind of formed around him as a person some say it could be somebody like Elon Musk, the founder of Tesla. Some others say he's a, uh, uh, he's a, he's a Japanese um, academic, um, maybe somebody who has died in, in the meantime. But nevertheless, what we do know is um, Satoshi has came, has came up with this uh, paper and he very clearly laid out and defined what is a blockchain, and he clearly laid out and defined what is Bitcoin and how does mining work um, and how that all is enabled by the rise of available computer power. And uh, through the internet, I think mean, you don't need to have this one uh, really big computer that is able to do amazing things through um, the internet. You can decentralize um, uh, requests for computers and CPU power. And, and that is something that he capitalized on by saying, look, um, as a global internet community, we can use everybody's uh, CPU power and combine that to do something really amazing without the need to have a, a large data center in in the middle. And that was, that was quite revolutionary. And let's have a look at, uh, in this particular session, we have a look at uh, cryptocurrencies really through a lens of, of safety. Um, so one keyword that we, you will hear Quite a lot is blockchain and, and basically what that means is also that uh, we have a decentralized system where information is stored in a long chain in a long blockchain of information and everybody can see it right? a public blockchain and there are different blockchains out there but for the purpose of this session let's have a look at a, at a public blockchain all these transactions every information that is in a transaction is kind of freely available when you have a look at that data because you can, if you want, you become a part of that blockchain because um, immediately when you see some data, well, you remember the data and you store it somewhere and you can validate kind of your copy of a blockchain with how the, the blockchain then kind of exists um, and evolves in the future. So basically that makes the system extremely, extremely safe. But again, 
we have a, a separate session where we talk about that even even more um, from a from a um, blockchain perspective. But when we think about bitcoins, there is only a limited number of bitcoins available on out there, and there is also um, a mathematical formula that talks about the expectation kind of when these bitcoins will be made available or will be mined and we talk about that also what that actually means so in total we have 21 million bitcoins that um, are available out there and uh, around 2013 we had roughly half of that a little bit less than half of that have been already mined so kind of uh, the early frenzy is over and as you can see by kind of that, that line kind of getting a bit flatter and flatter over time and we're now at 2018 and it, it's getting actually much flatter than it was a couple of years ago. So that means nothing else, but it's getting harder and harder and more difficult to mine new Bitcoins. And they're still available, you know, you can still get them and you can still construct um, a business model around it, but it's just getting harder and harder to get it. And also um, when you go back in time and Bitcoin really starts um, about 10 years ago, um, back at that time, you know, people had kind of their security keys and the private and the personal keys to access uh, the electronic wallets where the, the bitcoins are stored um, and a lot of that data has been lost i come back to that in a second so that means also that a lot of bitcoins um, and some say it's actually in the millions are unavailable and can't be retrieved because it's such a secure kind of method of um, transacting uh, that if you don't have the precise code and key to unlock your electronic wallet um, then you will not be able to retrieve uh, the bitcoins and a lot of people are quite frustrated because that has has happened to them a kind of a little story here is the first bitcoin transaction that has um, taken place is said to be a transaction where somebody purchased a pizza and paid that pizza with ten thousand bitcoins right and you would now say just to make up a number, um, we had Bitcoin value close to 20,000, but they say 10,000 is the value of a Bitcoin. So 10,000 times 10,000 for a pizza is quite steep. But at that time when the Bitcoin was used, the, the Bitcoin was kind of worth a couple of cents. And, you know, that was when, and, and plus uh, it was not really a valid method of, uh, for a transaction. So it was probably more fun by the person who paid in the Bitcoin and fun by the person who accepted the Bitcoin. But um, that pizza, which is kind of probably worth in Bitcoins now in the double digit millions, only is, is it, um, is that um, uh, contains that value or has that value um, if you have all the keys to retrieve the Bitcoins. And that's the problem. And in many cases, the keys have been lost. Uh, just think about, you know, the last three or four computers you had. Do you still really have all your data? Do you still have all your hard drives? Probably not. And the information that is contained on the hard drives. I've Over the years, I stored data on um, DVDs and uh, USB sticks and portable servers and whatnot. And uh, you tend to lose data because these devices break, right? And they are, when they break, data gets uh, gets lost and it's quite inevitable. And we only kind of in recent years have seen the rise of, of, of the cloud data. But even there, you don't know if really all the data is um, saved in a, in a secure way or if there's a risk that you can lose the data over time. Just really quick, uh, what is meant with um, Bitcoin mining? So where do the Bitcoins come from? Um, I was talking about blockchain, but again, if you want to know more about blockchain, look at another session that I've created specifically on that topic. But basically what I want to tell you is when you um, look at a blockchain, a blockchain is a distributed ledger, and it means that every transaction that happens, every information that relates to that transaction, it is, is getting stored into that blockchain. And that means that very quickly, the data literally explodes by kind of transactions going on uh, around uh, the globe. And I think the, I've, I've read something that the first banking blockchain transaction now has taken place. I think it was uh, a delivery of um, uh, of grain or something in Southern, uh, Southern America 
two banks have been involved in that transaction. That is already a lot of data about, you know, when, what has happened when and what kind of um, uh, inco terms are involved and so forth. Um, and with that explosion of data, there's immediately a need to compress data, right? Maybe you have, uh, remember uh, back the days when you had your first um, computer and you, uh, there was this little program set uh, defragment to your hard drive. And what it would do is would kind of pick up all the little bits and pieces of data that sit on your hard, hard drive and put it into one corner. And that just makes the whole thing more efficient in terms of um, it being faster of a hard drive but also um, makes it cleaner that you can store more information on the hard drive. And basically that's the same thing. So this is nothing else than a kind of a, a mathematical problem to solve. And Satoshi Nakamoto came up with that idea. Well, we just put out that problem to the public to solve, uh, let's say, a, la a very long um, number of variables, you know, to um, have a mathematical problem. That, is, that can be solved by anybody who know, whoever solves that first, thereby compressing the data, gets a reward and reward are 12.5 bitcoins, right? And that's what, what's meant with mining, that kind of people use, um, some use just a, a normal laptop, others would use a really large data center to do this Bitcoin mining, compressing the data and, and thereby get bitcoins as reward. And that's, that's, that's what meant with um, Bitcoin mining and Maybe just really quick, what sits behind that is the idea just to use it also as a as a business model where you think about um, you know how difficult is to is it to solve the equation, how powerful is your computer, uh, how valuable is the Bitcoin right now on on the income side, and on the other side on the cost side you look at uh, how expensive is it to run um, the computer, how expensive are the computers, uh, electricity costs and so forth. And you can just calculate, you know, how long it takes you to um, uh, break even with your um, with your mining uh, business. And uh, I've talked to people who run businesses like that, and they tell me that uh, the margins are are pretty healthy, and the margins are um, typically in the plus fifty percent area. But as I as I've shown you, kind of this curve is flattening, and uh, it is getting harder and harder to do this. But again, um, it's all kind of anonymous. And um, it is uh, all kind of done completely anonymized, and that makes it extremely, extremely safe um, for a transaction. And coming back to that um, specific, come back to that point of um, cybersecurity, um, encryption is a, is a big theme. So all that information is already encrypted and compressed. Um, plus uh, the, the Bitcoins that you possess or you send around and you receive, um, it is not, you know, bitcoins that sit in your uh, in your pocket. They sit in so-called bitcoin wallets, and the wallets are connected to exchanges. Because the exchange is a place where you can transfer a bitcoin into, let's say, a local currency that could be a pound, that could be a US dollar, that could be a euro. I think most um, exchanges are, you know, are using the US dollar as, as their currency. But as um, as Bitcoin is getting more and more popular, obviously other currencies are also available, and you can also trade by the way different um, Bitcoin denominated in different currencies through through Blackwell. So some of them are available in GBP, some of them are available in Euro, and some of them uh, are. Well, all of them are available also in US dollar. So that's that's quite powerful that you have different currencies that you can uh, base your transactions in. That also helps if you have a GBP account. You, you probably want to trade Bitcoin in GBP. It makes it very efficient to access it. But coming back to the Bitcoin wallets and the, the point on security, you need two keys to um, access the information in your electronic wallet. First, there's a private key. And uh, second, there's a public key. The public key is visible to everybody and similar to um, an account number. And just think back at what I've shown you in the beginning with that ransomware screenshot <coughs> where you need a combination of numbers and letters uh, to access an account. In that case, to transfer money to an account. That's a public key and doesn't need to be hidden. The public key has a private uh, counterpart. Um, you can also call it a, a digital signature and you need it for every transaction. That's something you should never ever lose. And that's already kind of a downside when you trade physical um, Bitcoin. If you ever lose that private key, 
yeah, it's quite likely that your bitcoins are lost, right? <coughs> and you will not be able to to get them back. And that can obviously cause problems. Think about it, you know, a couple of years down the line, you want to access your bitcoins. Um, and for whatever reason, you have lost that um, key combination, a private key combination, and uh, your, your bitcoins are gone. That can be very, very frustrating. Obviously, that does not happen to you with a broker um, because a broker will always help you access the account even if you are you've lost your info, information as long as you can identify yourself and that should always be possible you can always gain access to your funds and kind of add money withdraw money and all that but the private key is really really important on the other side what um, uh, what another positive is of that private key is it makes it virtually impossible to hack um, bitcoins and uh, an electronic wallet because it's just so there's so many different combinations possible that it's very, very unlikely that um, somebody will be able to identify, you know, exactly that public key, private key combination that uh, will give um, you access to the Bitcoin wallet. So we're talking about billions and billions of possible combinations. And um, well, it would take you a rather long time with brute force, in other words, when you try all combinations to then identify the ones that um, give you access to, to a wallet. So that is um, extremely, extremely unlikely that's going to happen. It's not impossible. Um, everything is possible, but it's it's more likely that you win the lottery a couple of times in, you know, back to back um, than cracking a, a Bitcoin wallet. Makes it probably the safest um, currency out there. This is how such a Bitcoin wallet actually looks like. So you can see here um, the Bitcoin wallet has a couple of transactions and you can see um, some of the keys that are being used. You know, the first one is like 1361B5CB and so forth. A really long uh, letter and number, small caps, large caps combination, which is um, very, very difficult uh, to um, play around with or guess. And, and that makes makes it just very, very safe what we also see more and more it's quite interesting that um, bitcoin itself is being accepted as a method of payment um and uh, that is something that we will see more and more and uh, kind of i've seen uh, the first cases where people have actually made uh, transactions on property using uh, bitcoins i think this is a bit more exotic right now but a lot of this is getting a bit more mainstream um when you look at uh, this coin dl platform i don't have any affiliation with that you can buy uh, music with bitcoins and uh, i've also seen in zurich i've seen the first uh, bitcoin atm quite a while ago so um, uh, stay tuned for kind of more um, bitcoin being accepted directly and that obviously makes it very interesting just to give an example if you're allowed to you know purchase a coffee in let's say Berlin or London or Kuala Lumpur with a Bitcoin, uh, you know, then basically you don't have any uh, exchange rate fluctuations. You maybe have a different price because the price, you know, the, the amount of Bitcoin you have to pay in a different location goes up and down, but it is one currency, one cryptocurrency. And as you can probably even immediately see that that um, is very attractive in a global financial services market. Uh, where so many different currencies uh, exist for good reason, uh, right? But I'm sure that um, the revolution has already started and, um, you know, the, the more Bitcoin will be accepted, kind of the more people will vote with their feet and transform um, the existing financial services system. Safety is always also a question of um, regulation. And let's have a look at uh, the regulation around the globe. So I've um, looked at a number of really important jurisdictions. Let's um, start with kind of the top right, China. China is not happy with so-called ICOs. Uh, these are initial coin offerings. It's basically kind of going public uh, with, a, with a new coin, with a new cryptocurrency. It's not allowed in China. They also try to avoid mining. I 
kind of shared the example of mining with you before. This is the context we need to have that conversation. And as you can imagine, China is very, very focused on kind of getting its economy ahead and all that. And they don't see a lot of value in um, putting kind of energy and resources in kind of mining some, some cryptocurrency. They would rather put that energy um, and resources into the manufacturing industry that gets the country ahead and got the country to the point where they are. Uh, South Korea is also not fond of ICOs. Uh, they don't want to have any foreigners uh, trade in cryptocurrencies. And then a very different view in, in Japan. If you just go a little bit uh, east, uh, the Japanese are probably the most advanced when it comes to cryptocurrency. Also not very surprising. If you've ever been to Japan, you will have seen that um, they are very sophisticated and uh, uh, front of the boat, would the Americans say. Um, so front of a boat in terms of adopting technology, robotics and all that. So they're quite happy with the idea of using cryptocurrency and they've even uh, issued a, a rule book for institutional rules for, for the use of cryptocurrency. So that's a, that's a very crypto friendly market, probably by far the most friendly market I've seen so far. Uh, you can go to uh, Singapore. Um, you can go to India and there's a lot of concerns around when I say AML visa anti-money laundering uh, rules that are being introduced. There's a lot of nervousness around kind of dirty money um, being used here to finance dirty activities, as you've seen with the ransomware. So um, if you are a professional hacker, you probably don't want to go to India and Singapore as your base because that, that that's something they, they don't like and they will uh, try to actively uh, kind of enforce uh, rules against that. When you go to um, Israel and uh, uh, another country also um, has done that, we will see that when you go around is um, they, they've interestingly, interestingly defined a cryptocurrencies not as currencies, but as uh, taxable assets and we look at the return. So that's also a big conversation around kind of the, the taxation issues and uh, the tax. People don't like it again because it's so anonymous because right now they, they really don't have any way to uh, enforce um, anything uh, on on cryptocurrencies, but that will change, right? And uh, at some point, money needs to flow from a, a bank account into an electronic wallet, and that's the, the point we're, we're looking for. Uh, and uh, that can get you in trouble, you know, as soon as they find out um, that could be could be a problem. In the US, um, they're talking a lot about listing of Bitcoin-based ETFs, exchange-traded funds as a vehicle to trade um, uh, Bitcoins. Well, I think we are quite lucky in Europe that we can also do that through CFDs. Uh, we can also kind of avoid all that regulatory problem here. Um, so I don't know if you trade Bitcoins, kind of real Bitcoins, but you maybe want to have a look at, at CFDs because they um, are a quite kind of efficient use of, of capital and um, they are uh, kind of covered by the regulation in, in each country. You can use uh, some some leverage. It's not unlimited. Normally it's kind of one to five, one to 10 maximum leverage. Um, you can have a look at the Blackwell website, kind of what the current leverage there is. But that's that's quite quite interesting uh, use as an alternative to uh, real uh, Bitcoins. Also, it takes quite a while to settle a Bitcoin transaction on exchange. And uh, with, um, yeah, with, uh, with a CFD broker, obviously that happens in seconds and not in hours. Um, the, the same um, anti-money anti, anti uh, money laundry concerns, uh, um, you see that in UK and EU. Uh, interestingly, Switzerland um, is quite pro-cryptocurrencies and they to try to attract them um, into Switzerland to set up a, a kind of a, a very positive environment for cryptocurrencies. And Russia, similar to Israel, um, defines cryptocurrencies as assets and not as currencies. Um, to finish out this session, let's just have a quick look at the cryptocurrencies that are available at, uh, at Blackwell. Um, and you see it's quite a range of cryptos um, available. And uh, I've listed here kind of a, the most important one for you, uh, Bitcoin, Litecoin, Ethereum, Ripple. Um, just really quick, Bitcoin and Litecoin, um, they are quite closely correlated. And I would encourage you also to have a look at um, a trading strategy um, session that we have um, done on uh, correlation strategies uh, between uh, different coins 
Bitcoin and Litecoin, I think it's a good example. Bitcoin suffers a bit from the high margin requirements and, and a comparably big spread. Litecoin is kind of the little uh, sister to Bitcoin. Some say uh, Bitcoin is gold, Litecoin is silver. Uh, so they're highly correlated. Um, they're not perfectly correlated all, all the times. So that's their potential um, arbitrage or spread arbitrage or spread trading opportunities arise. So have, have a look at that trading strategy um, session. That's quite helpful. Ethereum uh, was a really cool innovation on um, on cryptos uh, because it allows uh, smart contracts. Again, have a look at that session that we've done on uh, blockchain where we talk a bit more about what that actually means but uh, in its most simplistic form it just gives you more um, ability to store information on the blockchain and when you think about business applications that is quite useful and important uh, traders are really keen on ripple because uh, ripple has a slightly different model it uh, doesn't use the decentralized um, ledger option it has a more of a centralized settlement system and everybody can have access to the system and see what's going on um, what that does is um, it creates kind of spreads and margin requirements kind of uh, more in line with what we know from um, currency trading and also the settlement is extremely, extremely fast. So you can uh, day trade uh, Ripple much better than most of um, the other cryptocurrencies and there's more available. And I think that's, that's pretty cool what Blackwell has done here. There's more available, there's Monero, Dash and so forth, a different um, kind of cryptocurrency correlations um, are available di directly so that's that's um, uh, that's quite interesting um, addition uh, to the, uh, kind of the, the, the Bitcoin offering but I have not seen elsewhere and also um, they're offering um, cryptocurrency denominated in, in different currencies not just US dollar but also euro and GBP which is quite helpful when you run a, a euro or GBP account um, and uh, I think just have a look at kind of uh, um, have a look at the different uh, cryptocurrencies they are all available also in a demo account and play around with that and kind of try to familiarize yourself with it um, also have a look at the, the sessions we, we do on you know looking at how a price can develop nobody knows how it really will develop uh, and if you are interested in trading it uh, have a look at our short term and uh, medium to long term setups that you're pointing out not as a get a rich quick scheme but as a kind of give you a starting point you know how to look at cryptocurrencies from a trading perspective so there is a uh, exciting times i'd say and there's a lot of opportunity out there again let me summarize um, cryptocurrencies are unbelievably safe despite their bad reputation for ransomware a reason why the hackers have chosen it is because it's so an uh, it's 100% it's anonymous and it is safe. We talked about the electronic wallets and I showed you the private and the public key and the high level of encryption that is available there. So it's really impossible to steal um, a Bitcoin from you. Uh, it also has its downsides when you trade in kind of real Bitcoins. Uh, you have to go to your wallet and it can take hours for a transaction to settle. Uh, we have looked uh, had, had a look at um, mining. We had a look at regulation around the globe and kind of made the case that CFDs are quite efficient means of um, uh, trading uh, cryptocurrencies, Bitcoin and so forth. And in the end, we looked at the diverse offering um, that's available through, through Blackwell, uh, ranging from Litecoin over Ethereum to Ripple and, and a couple of kind of newer Bitcoins or sorry, cryptocurrencies. And let's see how they how they do, because we never know, you know, uh, maybe the the next uh, big revolution is already in the in the Blackwell portfolio from a terms in terms of cryptocurrencies and the, and the value goes up like we've seen at the end of 2017. We don't know that. Um, what we do know is that we have heightened volatility, and as traders, that gets us very very excited. All right, I hope you found this session on uh, safety and cryptocurrencies and cybersecurity interesting, and uh, I would encourage you to uh, have a look at all the other sessions that we have created. So thank you very much and uh, all the best for your trading.